Trains do an amazing job. They can cross whole countries and even whole continents, getting hundreds of people from one place to another using routes that are often cheaper, faster, and more environmentally friendly than cars or planes. Even the best designed trains have a shelf life though, and eventually, every single train and carriage will reach the end of the line. Many of them are scrapped and recycled, but others are left behind and forgotten, becoming abandoned monuments to the days of transport past. In this video, we're taking a virtual tour of the most amazing abandoned train sites in the world and the stories behind them. Canfranc train station in Spain might be abandoned right now, but it isn't necessarily going to stay that way forever. As it was once the second largest train station in all of Europe, it would only be fitting if it could be restored to its former glory. The site is a strange place. Despite its grand proportions, it was built high up in the Pyrenees, close to a village that homes only 500 people. The Spanish government had hoped it would become a major crossing point between Spain and France, but sadly things didn't go to plan. When it opened in July 1928, it was considered such a big deal that Spanish King Alfonso XIII and French President Gaston Dumerge were both in attendance. But it quickly became apparent that nobody had taken into account that differently sized rail gauges were used in Spain and France. That brought practical issues, but the global recession that occurred the following year brought financial issues too. By 1930, less than 100 people per day were using the station. Shortly after that, the tunnels were closed during the Spanish Civil War. They reopened later on, but by 1970 the station was crumbling, and the decision was taken to close it. Interest from tourists since then has seen a campaign launched to have it fully restored. The Great Northern X215 doesn't move on the rails anymore, but that doesn't mean that it never welcomes any customers. Although it's long past its usefulness as a moving vehicle, it's been converted into a vacation home, welcoming guests all year round at its permanent location in Montana, Canada. The little caboose train car doesn't look like much from the outside, but when you walk through the doors, you'll find a surprisingly spacious and modern environment, large enough to sleep six guests at the same time. With all of its wood furnishings and up-to-date amenities, you'd struggle to believe that the shell of the unusual hotel was built in 1941, but it was. The owners of the X215 say that it's a busy business and that anyone wanting to book a stay there usually has to do so at least a year in advance. Looking at these pictures, we can see why. Beneath the Waldorf Hotel in Manhattan, New York, there's a top secret railway and train service that's said to have been built to help U.S. presidents and high-ranking officials escape from New York in the event of a dire emergency. Known as Track 61, this is a part of the subway that the average American citizen never gets the chance to see. It may look old and abandoned, but it's thought that the facilities here would still be serviceable if the need ever arose. Everything you see here was built at the same time as Grand Central Terminal, but was kept off limits to the public. If you can find your way to the powerhouse, you'll see that there's still an old train car parked up, waiting to be called into action. Although the government will never confirm or deny what goes on at Track 61, the presence of an unmarked brass door at street level above the station confirms that access to the station from the street is possible and that someone may still occasionally use the route today. As its name implies, the Detroit, Toledo, and Ironton Railroad was built to connect the town of Ironton, Ohio to Michigan. Almost 400 miles of track were built, stretching from Ironton all the way into the midst of Michigan's car manufacturing plants. But the rails and the trains that once ran on them sit in a permanent state of abandonment today. You can trace the use of this line all the way back to 1848, when the Iron Railroad was officially incorporated. It expanded greatly over the following 80 years, but when the Quackerton coal seam began to run dry in the early 1920s, a steep and sudden decline set in. Mile by mile, the track was closed down a piece at the time. 
The railway post office route that used the line was closed in 1953, and although various other industries and types of traffic were introduced, there was no longer any purpose for the railroad by the end of 1983. You can still see railroad shops dotted along the route, and even the occasional distinctive red rail car, although those which were left out in the open are now in a state of severe dilapidation. The technology of trains never stands still, with every nation and every company that operates trains constantly looking for ways to go faster and become more efficient. During the 1970s, the Soviet Union came up with the idea of a turbojet rail car, which, as you can see from these pictures, had a very unusual and distinctive appearance. As you can also tell from the pictures, the idea didn't catch on, and the train has been abandoned for a very long time. Although the team responsible for making the train were able to get it up to 160 miles per hour, which was a huge deal for the era, its fuel consumption was enormous and made the idea of commercial operation totally non-viable. As forward-thinking as the concept was, it was also surprisingly simple in execution. Making it run was just a case of strapping a pair of jet engines to the top of a conventional locomotive and then pushing them up to full speed. Underneath the thick layers of rust that have accumulated on the surface of the train in the near 50 years since its abandonment, you can still get a sense of how impressive it must have looked when it was new. If you're a fan of abandoned trains, the site of the train graveyard in Barreiro, Portugal, is a place that has to be seen to be believed. There isn't just one abandoned train here, there are several. And if you visit two or three times a year, you'll see different trains each time. Sadly, they're not here for happy reasons. This is where old trains come to die, either through being torn apart and sold for scrap, or by being buried deep in the ground. The Barreiro site didn't start life as a train graveyard. It opened in 1861 as an important railway terminal and was successful in that endeavor until the Second World War broke out. Trade resumed after the war, but not at anything like the same level. So when the oil crisis of the 1970s arrived, it finished the old terminal off. Some of the trains you can find there now date back to that era, although the majority of them have become canvases for local graffiti artists. Barreiro isn't the only hotspot for old and abandoned trains in Portugal. You'll find another one in Peso de Regua at the old Regua station. And despite their rusted and battered appearance, they are priceless antiques. The four mallet-type locomotives were the first of their kind to enter Portugal after being built in Germany by the famous manufacturing company Henschel & Sohn in 1910. Their purpose was to serve the Cargo Valley Line connecting Peso de Regua to Chaves, but the line has long since been abandoned, and so have these trains. They're not alone at the shell of the station. They're joined by a slightly newer Henschel Mallet built in 1923, and a single Duro Dekovic diesel multiple unit. The cargo line didn't officially close until 2011, although these much older trains were out of service long before that. With nobody to care for them, they're available to buy if there's a collector out there who has the money to acquire them and the means to have them shipped from Portugal. At one point during the 1980s, Vic Berry's Scrapyard in Leicester was one of the strangest tourist attractions in England. Where else in the world could you see a pile of Type 2 diesel locomotives stacked on top of each other, like somebody was trying to build a tower out of them? The scrapyard was opened by Vic Berry himself in 1973, with a focus on breaking up and scrapping unwanted former passenger coaches. He eventually got a contract for breaking up BR Class 76 electric locomotives, as well as the carriages. And that's when the famous collection of old trains at the site really began to grow. Soon there were Class 25s, Class 27s, and even trains from the famous London Underground at the scrapyard waiting for the attention of Vic and his team. He even branched out into restoration, stripping old carriages and trains of asbestos and then selling them back to railway preservation societies once he'd made them safe. Sadly, there isn't much to see at the old site now. A huge fire led to the closure of the yard in 1991 and also caused a dangerous cloud of asbestos to spread across the skies above Leicester. 
While we probably associate steam trains more closely with the United Kingdom than we do any other European nation, that isn't to say that the UK has a monopoly on beautiful old steam trains. In fact, the most stunning collection anywhere on the continent is in Turkey, which is home to the Kamlik Railway Museum. The museum is as authentic as it is impressive. Even the rails that the proud old trains stand upon date back to the 19th century. Train enthusiasts will find more than 30 steam engine trains here, with the most recent example made in 1951 and the oldest dating back to 1891. Most of the museum is outdoors, and its owners are pretty relaxed about their collection. So if visitors want to climb onto one of the trains for the perfect photo opportunity, they're welcome to do so. All of the trains have their own story, which is documented within the indoor section of the museum. But the most significant piece of rail history here is a private carriage built for and owned by Kemal Atatürk, the first ever leader of the Turkish Republic. You don't need to know a lot about trains to understand the purpose of the Narrow Gauge Railroad Museum in Nevada City, California. There's a big clue in the name. Unlike the Kamlik Railway Museum, which allows nature to take its course on its collection of old steam engines, the Narrow Gauge Railway Museum is staffed by hundreds of volunteers who keep their old trains clean and shiny. The rail line here is synonymous with the California Gold Rush and opened in April 1874. Part of the museum is given over to the lives of John and Sarah Kidder, who were responsible for the opening and operation of the line and were made very rich by its success. The whole museum is full of trains in various states of repair or disrepair, but one of them is a movie star. In CNGRR, engine number five has been repeatedly loaned out to Universal Studios for a variety of different films and has a more impressive filmography than some of the most celebrated stars in Hollywood. From looking at pictures of the Esashi train line in Japan, you would presume that this route ceased operation decades ago and the shells and abandoned facilities that stand there today have been empty for decades. That isn't the case. It was just a sleepy old line that limped on for years past the point where it should have been closed down, and the last train ran on these rails as recently as 2014. The 26-mile line ran from coast to coast in the north of the country when it opened in 1936, mostly serving small villages that didn't have road access. Road access eventually came in the decades that followed, though, and as it did, it reduced passenger numbers on the line. By the turn of the century, there were only six services running each day, and even they were half empty. Now all that's left are these rusting shells and carriages. Still, the landscape around them is beautiful. We don't know whether to call the site of this train wreck in Grays Harbor, Washington, USA, a fantastic and historic site, or an example of reckless and irresponsible littering. As convincing as it looks, this train and its carriages never really crashed. They were thrown into the gorge deliberately by a movie company working on the production of the film Ring of Fire in 1961. Even back then, the section of the railway above the fake crash scene by the Wainuchi River had been abandoned for a decade. Somehow, the studio gained permission to burn the tracks and detonate explosives, ensuring the train would meet with its fate. Only after the camera stopped rolling did they realize that they had no means to retrieve the broken wreck of the train or its engine, which had fallen out and landed directly in the water. They washed their hands of the responsibility, and so nearly 60 years later, the wreck is still there. The site has recently gained a new lease on life as a tourist attraction as it's become popular with thrill-seekers who enjoy the activity of geocaching. Subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, and enjoy watching new videos on my channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon!